next speaker is John Haskins, who is joining us from Georgetown University. And he will be speaking on, should corporations have the right to vote? The paradox in theory of corporate moral agency. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this. I'm happy to be able to speak at this conference. Although, it seems to be my fate. This is the second time in a year and a half I've been called upon to give a talk that is somewhat critical of Philip Pettit's work immediately after he spoke. <laughs> this is the second time I've done this. This paper is actually, and it's about corporate moral responsibility, not more general collector moral responsibility. This paper is actually the middle of three. At the last conference I was at when Philip Pettit was speaking in INSEAD, I had a paper that is still. Uh, I'm pretty sure this group is fairly familiar with Philip Pettit's work. So in his article, Responsibility Incorporated, he argues that corporations are fit to be held responsible and that they should be held responsible. And in the first paper in this series, I said that I have no quibble with his argument that corporations are fit to be held responsible, but I introduced some reasons why perhaps they shouldn't be held responsible. All right, this paper is being presented at a conference of about collective responsibility for the future. This is another step removed from that. What I'm saying is assume that corporations are not only fit to be held responsible, but there's reasons of why they should be held responsible. What are some of the implications from that? And one of the implications is for the future that we're going to have to extend to corporations a lot of rights that they don't ordinarily have. Uh, most of the reading I did on the matter sees the idea of corporations having a right to vote as a reductio of the idea that corporations are persons or moral actors. But if it's a reductio, it's going to be a problem for corporate moral agency generally. I think I can, I, everyone says this, but I think I can be brief and then leave a lot of time for discussion. Let me try to introduce the thesis of the paper quickly. But here's the basic claim. Uh, if the argument for corporate moral agency is a sound one, it makes sense. So there is corporate moral, agency, corporate moral agency, and you connect that with democratic theory, or specifically liberal democratic theory. Put those two things together, then corporations should have the right to vote. So if a corporate, corporate moral agency implies a corporate right to vote under certain assumptions having to do with liberal democracy, okay, so why? Here's my characterization of the requirements for corporate moral agency. This is drawn from the work of Philip Pettit and several others who have commented as well. It's not his terminology. I have his terminology in the paper. At first, he says that you need value relevance, value judgment, and value sensitivity. In the later work with Christian List, he changes the name so that it's now normative significance, judgmental capacity, and relative control. But when you read through what's been discussed, in order for there to be moral agency, you have to have an autonomous being who can exercise normative judgment, can make, can understand moral questions, and can make moral judgments, and then has the capacity to act on them. If you have those three things, you have the requirements for moral agency. And the argument in Responsibility Incorporated and several others is that corporations have these three things, and therefore they're moral agents. So that's the requirements. Uh, I don't, in the paper, discuss the other two. I take them for granted. I do discuss the argument for corporate autonomy a bit. And basically, the reason why we should believe that corporations are autonomous agents is that corporate attitudes, commitments, and decisions are not a function of the attitudes, commitments, and decisions of the individuals, of the individual members of the corporation. Why should we believe that? Well, Philip Pettit and others like David Kopp talk about the discursive dilemmas or the impossibility theorems by which they show that corporations often will, to, if they're going to be rational actors, they're going to have to take actions that don't represent the actions, the beliefs, the attitudes of any of the individual members. So this is the argument that's put forward to show that corporate, corporations do have autonomy. Here's a couple of quotes that explain it. This is Philip Pettit. Autonomy is intuitively guaranteed by the fact that on one or more issues, the judgment of the group will have to be functionally independent of the corresponding member judgments. So 
that its intentional attitudes as a whole are most saliently unified by the imprecisely attitudes of the group. Here's another quote from Kendi Hess. She's done some follow-up work. She's writing in the same vein. Corporate, corporations' actions stem from their own actional strengths and their own reasons, responsive mechanisms. So these are the arguments introduced to show that corporations actually are autonomy, autonomous agents. OK, that's corporate moral autonomy. Let's talk about the right to vote. Again, this is an argument that's relevant to a liberal democratic society. I didn't want to get into a long-winded discussion of political philosophy. I was reaching for something that seems to be fairly widely agreed upon among liberal political theorists. I'm not a political theorist, so I just went out and did the research. So with the basic definition, democracy is the government of a community through the participation of the government. I think that's from Carl Cohen. <clears throat> when I started to look into it, you have the all affected interest principle, which is fairly broad. I chose a more limited, modest version of that, which is the all subjected interest principle. Basically, it's the contention that everyone who's subject to the outcome of the democratic process, or everyone who's subject to the law that's produced by a democratic government, all of those who are responsible for conforming their behavior to the law have the right to vote. What's the basis of the right to vote in the democratic, in democratic theory? Well, everybody's going to, or everybody's interests will be affected, or more narrowly, everyone's going to have to obey the law. And if you're going to obey the law, you have to have some say in its creation, and that comes from the right to vote. So this is associated with Rousseau, with Locke, to some extent, I have a long quote in the paper from John Rawls, where his, his principle of equal participation, that basically says this is at the root of a liberal democratic society. OK, so what, gives, what qualifies you for the right to vote? You're subject to the law. What does it mean to be subject to the law? What's required for one to be subject to the law? To be subject to the law, you have to be capable of obeying it. Number one, you have to be an autonomous agent. You have to be an autonomous agent. Also, you have to understand what the law is telling you to do. Not every law has a moral imperative, but let's assume there's a moral duty to obey the law, whether you agree with that or not. You have to be an autonomous agent with the capacity to understand the moral imperative that's embodied in the law. And you also have to have, to have the self-control that's necessary to conform your behavior to that imperative. There's plenty of things that are objects of the law. Animals can be objects of the law. We have a duty not to treat them cruelly. But they're not subject to the law. They can't possibly have to conform their behavior to the law. To be subject to the law is to be required to act in accordance with what with the injunction of the law is imposing upon you. If I have to stop at a red light because that's traffic laws, then I'm subject to the law. So here's the requirements. One has to be an autonomous agent, the capacity to understand the moral imperative about the law, and the self-control necessary to conform one's behavior to that imperative. OK, so what's required for one to be subject to the law? Autonomy, normative judgment, and the capacity for self-control. <coughs> the requirements for corporate moral autonomy are the same as the requirements for the right to vote in a liberal democracy. So therefore, either corporations have the right to vote, or they're not morally responsible agents. You can pick one or the other. But since the requirements for each are the same, if you get one, you get the other. In the paper, I canvass many objections, but because this is a brief presentation, I'll quickly mention two. There's a very good objection to the idea of corporations having the right to vote. Individuals who comprise the corporation, they already have the right to vote. So aren't corporate interests already properly represented in a democratic decision process? That, that objection makes perfect sense to me. It's just not available to the people who are advocating corporate moral agency. Because the argument for corporate moral agency is based on the idea that corporate autonomy is established by showing that the interests of the corporation are not the same as the interests of any proper subset of their constituent individual members. I and mean, that's how the advocates of corporate moral agency establish corporate autonomy. So, 
the corporations must have interests, beliefs, desires of their own that can't be represented by the individuals. Therefore, this objection won't work. So the corporations don't need the right to vote. There's another objection I look at in the paper. I'll mention briefly. And that's corporate moral agency does not imply that corporations are persons. I think this was the big objection to Peter French originally. He said corporations are persons. No, they're not. Corporate moral agency just means that they're moral actors. That's more limited. Fair enough. So therefore, corporate moral agency does not imply that, imply that corporations possess all the rights of persons or all personal rights. That makes perfect sense. I, I don't know if you can read this. Personal rights are rights that preserve one's ability to make fundamental value decisions that give meaning to one's existence, determine what type of person each of will be, the kind of things that you know, give meaning to our life. That, that's fine. Just that the right to vote is a political right. It's not a personal right. The right to vote apparently comes out of the social contract. All you have to be is somebody who's going to be subject to the law in order to get the right to vote. In a democracy, those who have to abide by the rule of law are the ones who get a say. This is a political right, not a personal right. Therefore, it doesn't fall subject to this objection. There are some other objections I cover in the paper. And there's an argument, uh, another argument that I claim supports this. But I'd rather just stop at this point and entertain your comments and open things up for discussion get your feedback on this. So let me stop there. The queue is open for uh, discussion. Thank you for that. And I, I, I will read the paper, so there's probably something that's in the paper that I'm missing. We start by saying all those subjects to the law, all those responsible for conforming their behavior to the law, have the right to vote. And that's not true. Um, I don't know if you're arguing they should all have no, no, the right to vote, but they absolutely don't. Only citizens have the right to vote. I live in Australia, and I'm absolutely um, subject to the law there, but I can't vote because I'm not a citizen. Corporations are not citizens. So where's the contradiction? Okay. Or are the, you arguing that I should be no, able to No, no, no. Just the second part. Yeah. The first part, here's an objection. An objection to the, I'm not up there. Objection to the old objective principle. Only citizens have the right to vote. You know what? That's true. That's true today. Why is it true? In the paper, there's a very, very, very long footnote that covers this. It's true today. But I'll tell you a story about why it's true. Originally, citizenship was not the qualification for the right to vote. It was um, residency. If you were an inhabitant of the, uh, of the country, the state, you got the right to vote. Why did citizenship become a requirement? Because in the old days, the right to vote was restricted. You had to be a white male property owner. You can, if you didn't own property, you couldn't vote. If you were white, you couldn't vote. If you were female, you couldn't vote. And what we wanted to do at the time, we wanted to extend the right to vote to more and more people. So the idea of associating it with citizenship was a way of liberalizing the right to vote. That was the case through the 19th century. The idea that citizenship would be a restriction came in because in the 19th century, there was a, at least in the United States, which I'm familiar with, there was a great deal of anti-immigrant feeling. We wanted to exclude the people who were coming in from other countries and living here from voting. And so citizenship was then seen as a restriction. Now, historically speaking, citizenship's not the restriction. It's just living there, being subject. That was, this was the understanding. Today, citizenship is used to restrict people from voting. I'm not sure that that's the morally correct understanding of this principle. For instance, in this country, in the United States, a big issue now is whether people who are convicted of felonies should have the right to vote. They can't. Why? They're excluded. But they're subject to the law, and the argument is it's not fair to exclude them because this is an illegitimate reason for not giving them the right to vote. And I'm going to suggest that having citizenship as the requirement, which is based on a a desire to exclude immigrants from participating in the government is also an illegitimate reason for violating this principle. This is the principle we should stick with. This is the right principle undergirding democracy. And the fact that citizenship violates it is a critique of citizenship requirement, not the principle. 
so your paper would argue that I should have the right to vote in the government as well. If you reside there and are governed by the law, yes. Thanks, Abby, at last night, UCF. Um, this is really interesting, and I think I, I agree with you that um, if we accept these, these assumptions, which I know you don't, but if we do, then I think this really opens up a whole bunch of questions about the right more attitudes to cooperation, and I think we are really at the beginning of thinking about that, so it's really necessary that we, wherever that's going to work, it's kind of, they, they start occupying the whole universe, so what are we doing with that? And something in me wants to resist your conclusions, even though I, I accept the collective small agency of corporate small agency of the group. So, and I, I think that, um, I tend to think about it more, but, but, but to me, something is presents the, the, the reasons why we start with giving individual rights in the first place. And I think we start giving individual rights in the first place because we have some view of the intrinsic value of human beings. Very, very hard indeed to to let me qualify what starts to work then. But we have some assumption about the intrinsic value of human beings, which we don't associate with corporations. Now, I think the three conditions that you give, the autonomy, moral judgment, capacity for self-control, are necessary conditions, but are not sufficient conditions for granting, or for assuming that agents have that kind of uh, intrinsic value. And it is, that it is, I think it is that intrinsic value that grants people Rights, including the right to vote. I'm not quite sure what you meant by saying it's not a personal right. I think it is a personal right in the sense that it's derived from, from our understanding of persons as having uh, intrinsic value uh, or need, need to be treated in a certain way. So for me, the whole, you kind of took the whole picture and kind of uh, put it on its point because the whole reason why we want to treat corporations as small agents and to assign them with responsibilities and rights is, is, is in order to protect individuals right? and, and to protect the intrinsic value of individuals. So we worry about corporations having uh, you know, too much power and expectations and so forth, so and that's why we kind of you know, treat them as, as agents. So, so I, I wonder what, you, what kind of your response to that, kind of an assumption that there is a fundamental difference. The corporation, even if it's more agents, there's nothing valuable about it in and of itself unless it somehow serves individuals. And that's the reason why we don't want to grant it so, that kind of rights. Well, we have a reason not to grant it. Yeah, I know that that's a good objection. The reason why I know it's a good objection is because that's the same objection that uh, Philip had and Christian West have in their group agency. Okay. Yeah. So no, but no, it, it's it's a it, it's a good point. I, I have to respond to it. Let me back up to what you said first, though. Uh, this, I said this is the middle of three papers. The third one I have a draft of is to say that if corporate moral agency is, is established, it also means that corporations have the right to speak, to engage political speech. That's going to fall out of this as well. So what, you know, what I'm saying is going along with being a moral actor carries some other rights along with it. Does it carry all rights? No. What rights doesn't it carry? It doesn't carry the rights that can only be associated with individuals who have personal lives to live and have intrinsic value. Corporations are not intrinsically valuable. That's your point. So some rights come along and others don't. Um, Kendi Hess, who I was working with, she's got four, you know, four bases for attributing rights to cooperation. So they, she dismisses the legal justification right away. There's a business ethics justification which she collapses into the political philosophy justification, which is a social contract argument. If you are going to form a government, then certain things are delegated. It's by agreement. And in order to be a participant in the social contract, you have to have the ability to understand and to make contracts. That's all. Then there's something beyond that. There's the fact that human beings are both intrinsically valuable and also vulnerable to all kinds of things. They have emotions. They can be hurt in certain ways. And there are certain rights that are associated with that level. Right. Can I make an argument that corporations have the last form of right? No, because corporations aren't persons. Corporations don't have these vulnerabilities. Therefore, corporations don't need those rights. Can I make an argument that if corporate, corporations are moral actors, they should have the rights that come along with the social contract? Yes, that's the argument that I'm making. Polit the right to vote and the right to speak on political subjects is not based on something having intrinsic value. For instance, the reason why you might want corporations to be able to vote or to speak is because they're a source of wealth that the rest of the population has a 
almost irresistible impulse to exploit, right? Just let's just keep increasing corporate taxes more and more and more and use it for other purposes. Maybe that's the right way to organize society. But the corporation is the kind of entity, it doesn't have any emotions, but it's the kind of entity that has an interest in having a say in how high corporate taxation is. The right to vote and the right to speak on political subjects is relevant to the corporation given its status, even though it's not intrinsically valuable. So that's why these rights come along with it. Set that aside. Holding corporations responsible, number one, it doesn't, individuals still are responsible. It doesn't offset individual responsibility. Anybody who does something wrong is blameworthy. We go after that. People who are complicit, people who are accomplices, all the levels of individual responsibility still exist. Should we add another level? Right, that's the question. There's some reasons why I would say it's inadvisable, but no one listens to me. So let's say we are going to hold corporations morally responsible. Let's start thinking about what the implications are. So this is paper number two. One implication is that the same requirements for corporate moral agency are the requirements for the right to vote from a social contract perspective. That the right to vote is not something that comes out of your being a human, you know, having certain characteristics. It comes out of the social contract. And the reason why you have it is so that you're not subject to exploitation by the will of the majority. You have some say, you get a say in the the vote's not much of a protection. That's why the third paper is we should have the right to speak as well. But it's some protection. And that comes along with corporate moral agency. So if I think either if I'm wrong or no one wants to listen to me about the inadvisability of holding corporations morally responsible, then go ahead. But they're going to have to get some protections that come along with being subject to the law. That's, a, that's as far as I'm willing to go. I mean, I, you can make a, a more extensive argument, but I'm going to stop there. Uh, Brandon Berg, uh, Old Green State University. I uh, really enjoyed the paper. Um, I'm curious, though, uh, one thing that I might push back on is the issue of possible double counting. Uh, there's a sort of liberal democratic principle of one person, yeah. one vote. Yeah. Uh, especially with uh, corporations that are owned by a small number of people. This might be something that you touch on in the free speech. That, that's a good point. Keep going. Like uh, Koch Brothers or Hobby Lobby, where uh, the political interests of the 
shareholders, which is a small number, would be unified. And if they get an extra vote, it might be sort of double counting on the part of the corporation. The corporation's interest will rather the yeah. shareholder. That's a good point. Um, there's a I'm sorry, it's a footnote in the third paper. Amy Sevenwall of Wharton makes the same kind of point. The corporation, you get two bites of the apple, you get a double vote. That's a problem. More interesting, Tom Donaldson of Wharton, when I presented a, something like this, showed like a mathematical objection. You can form as many corporations as you want. You can go out and incorporate yourself and your friends and all. You can get yourself 25 votes by just incorporating yourself lots of times. So you have a mathematical objection to this. Um, and that all makes sense to me. Why? Because I actually think what I call <coughs> objection one is a good objection. That makes sense to me. But that makes sense to me because I'm not committed to corporate moral agency. If you are committed to corporate moral agency, what that means is corporations have corporate autonomy because the corporate interests, the corporate beliefs, the corporate attitudes are not the attitudes of any individual or a proper subset of individuals of the corporation. That's the position that's being argued for. If that's true, then every corporation that exists has a different set of interests than any of the individuals. It's not double counting. It's the corporation gets a vote, and the individuals get their own vote, and since they have different attitudes, beliefs, desires, and goals, they are all equally represented. The nature of the objection you're making, which I think I agree with, assumes that there's something wrong with the basic argument for corporate moral agency. But if, it's, if, it's not, if there's nothing wrong with it, if we're wrong, then this objection doesn't defeat the right to vote argument. Uh, I have myself in the next item, too, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the notion of being a, a subject. Uh, it seems like one possible response that's available to advocates of uh, corporate moral autonomy is to say, look, when it comes to uh, understanding what it is to be a subject to some domain, to be or for certain norms to be applicable to a particular entity, there are a whole bunch of different statuses we can imagine assigning to somebody. Just within a particular nation state, you can think of children as being one sort of the case. They're sort of subject, but not quite. Uh, I mean, another type of case might be uh, more helpful, uh, the notion of uh, what status an entity enjoys in the international arena. There are states, there are quasi-states, there's the Palestinian Authority, there are, there are entities that are aspiring to be states, there are non-states. So we can say, well, what sort of, the particular bundle of, of rights and responsibilities that an entity enjoys is going to be a function of what sort of entity it is. So. Uh, the Palestinian Authority, they get some of the stuff, but not all. Why? That's just sort of what they are. And the same might be true of uh, uh, within particular states, where you can think of uh, semi-autonomous subunits within states, such as uh, mm -hmm. the indigenous populations of Canada and the United States. They're, they're kind of autonomous, but not quite. So are corporations, same thing. We can just say, Corporations can do some things, they're autonomous in these sorts of respects, but they can't vote because that's just the sort of entity that they are. They're not allowed to have that type of vote. Okay, that's, I'm going to, this is not meant to sound defensive. That's not just an objection, that's just a denial. Here's what I mean. Okay. For, I, first of all, I can't speak about the international arena because this argument is limited only to the assumption that you're functioning in a liberal democracy, and that's the voting process. Now, I'm not a political scientist, so to write this paper, I had to go out and read like, liberal democratic theory and educate myself. Luckily, across the hall from me, Jason Brennan, one of the good philosophers, political philosophers there, he gave me all the right sources. What seems to be common with liberal democratic theory is the idea that what gives you the right to vote is that you're the all affected interest principles associated with the Vink Robert Dahl. But that's, that's somewhat controversial. I went for the all subjected interest to be more modest. It says that in a liberal democracy, it's not that you're a subject, if you are subject to the law, like if you are going to be bound by the outcome of the democratic process, then you get a right to vote. Think about children. Children are not the full members of society. They're not, you know, a, they don't have a well enough developed maturity and understanding. So they don't 
not, they are subject to law in some ways. Children are not subject to the full law. That's why they have juvenile courts and everything else. What happens when they reach the age of majority? They're fully subject to the law. That's when they get the right to vote. So there are people with different statuses. But once they become recognized as a full member of the community, that's the same point at which they will be subject to jail. It's also the point at which they get to vote. So the fact that there are different statuses, corporations, if corporations aren't moral agents, they're still going to be subject to all regulation, all civil regulation, all civil liability, because that's got nothing to do with it. If you're going to be subject to what the law is going to apply to you, and you're a moral actor, that's what gives you the right to vote. Sure, there's a lot of different statuses, but in a liberal democracy, the thing that gives you the right to vote is the status of being subject to the law. But it's not just that, because Tony can't just show up one day in Perth, get fresh off the plane and say, I'm here, I'm going to vote now. It's, she should be able to. She just gets off the plane. Yeah, if, no, no, I, I, the, with regard to the, the footnote, back to the footnote, the footnote right. deals with two cases. Right. People who are very short-term temporary residents. That they don't get the right to vote. Why? Because their interests are not tied up with the interests of the society. Well, but if you're a resident alien, if you're not a citizen, if you live there, if your interests are tied up with that society, should you have the right to vote? Yes. Under the original theory, you did. The reason why citizens are excluded now is not a good moral reason for excluding citizens. It was simply because, at least in the United States, we didn't want to give the vote to all of these undesirable Italian, Jewish, Polish immigrants who were coming in, and it was a way of suppressing their, in the South, in, in the United States, we wanted the blacks not to be able to vote. We didn't want them to have citizenship. Civil, you know, the uh, Civil War was all about, do they get the civil rights, citizenship? Uh, citizenship shouldn't be an exclusion. It should only work when it's going to enfranchise people, not disenfranchise people. Okay, so I, I felt a little warm when you told me that resident aliens should learn from your principles. I had a resident alien like, like Tony. Um, I, I was wondering about tourists, um, but I'm also beginning to wonder, well, what about non-resident aliens, right? Because it seems as though you can say, well, look, there's, there's one piece of law that, you know, as a non-resident alien of the United States, I'm very much affected by, and it's the law that prevents me from from immigrating. You know, if, if I try, you know, and and although you know it might be plausible, I'd be very happy to see Norman resident aliens. Yes. Uh, sorry, resident aliens can vote. I don't think anybody's going to accept that non-resident. Okay. Now, well, let me stop you because I understand your point. It's right. I, okay, I'm going to characterize for you my reading in political philosophy because that's not my field. There's something called the all affected interest principle. That's what you're saying. But you're not, you know, someone in Germany is affected by American corporate law because of all the effects it has extraterritorially. The all affected interest principle is so broad that people from those who don't even reside in the country should get the right to vote if you went for that. So the all affected interest principle is a very, very broad basis for democracy and the right to vote. It's controversial. Uh, the people who do political philosophy argue back and forth, and a lot of people argue, <coughs> no, no, if the interest is really affected, then they should have input. Who cares if they reside on the other side of a border? People in Mexico should have a right to vote in American elections if it's going to determine their life prospects whether they cross the border or not. So that's one version. But that's a controversial version. It's so controversial that I wanted to avoid it. So I excluded it from my paper. There's a narrower version of what gives you the right to vote. Not that your interests are affected, not the all affected interests. There's this more modest version. You're subjected to the law. The law applies to you. Now that could still mean that sometimes people outside the United States should have to vote because if we pass laws that function extraterritorially, which the United States does sometimes, that means that there are going to be people who don't live in the United States that are subject to the law of the United States. And if we're going by liberal democratic theory, they should get to vote. Can you say more about this distinction between being affected and being subjected? Yeah. Because it seems to me that, you know, if, you if, 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 my, my, if what I'm doing is trying to enter a country, I'm not just affected by it. I, I am subjected to it in any sense which I'm subjected to the law of a place where I'm 
Uh, if you're trying to enter the United States illegally and you succeed, you'll, you, you'll be illegal. You'll be deported. Illegal. So I'm subject, I'm subject to the law. If we can describe what I'm doing as illegal. Yeah, you're. I'm going to say. I'm going to disagree and say no. You're affected. What makes it illegal? You're affected by the law. You're affected by the law. They'll pick you up and they'll send you back to where you came from. You're affected by the law. You're not subject to the law in the sense that the law of the United States doesn't apply to you if you live in Australia or Mexico. You don't have an obligation to obey the law of the United States. We will, we will treat you like an object and exclude you if you illegally come into the United States. But that doesn't mean that you have an, you have an obligation to obey our law, that you're, you're subject to our law. It affects you. You don't have a moral obligation to conform to the law of a country that you're not a, you don't reside in. Unless you're there. That's not how it works. If you're in the country, you do. Yeah. You are subject to the laws of the country if you're in the country. If you are, if you reside in the country for no, no, if you visit the country. If I mean, if I, if I think you live in the United States of the United Kingdom, I can be detained and you um, yeah, and various conditions will be imposed on me during my stay. Don't tell me George and Chucky. Who who are you telling? <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading that in Let's Go book when I went there 20 years and stopped bring drugs to Turkey. So if you bring drugs to Turkey, you will get locked yeah, really But but it's, it's, it's not it's not simple, it's not simply that if I try to illegally break, I'm just moved and, and you know, I mean there are various things that done to me that are sort of, you know, involve some kind of quasi-legal process. They might, if I claim asylum, I might be subjected to a quasi-judicial hearing and so on. Yeah, so it, it's not clear to me what, it's not clear to me exactly what the distinction between being affected and subjected is supposed to amount to in those cases. Which is why I'd like to know more about what it's supposed to be. Okay, yeah. I'm not disagreeing. There's no doubt that your interests are greatly affected by the law of the United States, even if you don't resign in the United States. What does it, what's the all subjective interest principle say? What does that mean? It means in order to be subject to the law in the country in which you reside, you have to be an autonomous agent, you have to understand what the requirements are, you have to have the capacity to conform to it. So if I reside in the United States and I have these capabilities, then I get the right to vote. If I reside outside of the United States, I may have the same capabilities, if I come and reside in the United States for a long period of time, I should get the right to vote. If I try to come in and I'm arrested and sent out, does that mean that I have the right to vote? No, it means that you're being treated like an object, that you're being excluded by our authorities. But it's not that you are somehow subject to our laws. You're being affected by our laws. You don't have the obligation to obey our laws. You. You're, you get the, you the right to vote, so if you're going to have to obey the law. We have time for one more question in this session, please. Thank you. I'm Abby Offerman from the Denver University. So um, uh, I find your argument very compelling, and I was wondering whether corporate moral agency advocates could also find it compelling, and, uh, but uh, maybe uh, go a further step and say, just like you mentioned in the paper, just like uh, we wouldn't want to refuse a vote from a wealthy person, right. we don't, we won't refuse a vote from a, a corporation. However, um, corporations have a tendency, that's an empirical fact, to produce very bad consequences in, in terms of you know, disadvantage, uh, and, and, and inequality in resources, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, what we want to do as grant votes, but take measures to mitigate that, just like we would do with wealthy people. I, I, I agree entirely. I think that's a perfectly legitimate point. I, I have to I'll quibble with one thing. When we talk about corporations, if you want to talk about the empirics of corporations, the overwhelmingly vast majority of corporations are very small, closely held corporations, or nonprofits, or charitable organizations. There's a very small tip of the iceberg, large corporations, which people like to say have all these bad empirical results. But that's the exception rather than the rule. So if you want to talk about whether the corporate effects are, you have to talk about corporations, not bad corporations. 
But at any rate, uh, this, the analogy is a perfect one. Very, very wealthy people in the United States can spend a lot of money to try to convince others to vote the way they see fit. That doesn't justify us in depriving the wealthy people of the right to vote. Does it mean that you might want regulations that curtail freedom of speech or that curtail or regulate how much money can be spent? You want campaign finance regulations? Yeah, that's the way we deal with the effect of wealth on its individuals. If you have corporations have the right to vote, most corporations don't have enough wealth to have any effect on things. Some corporations are so powerful that they have enough wealth so they could have a very significant effect. Does that mean that you would want regulations to somehow make it so that those corporations couldn't use their wealth to distort things? Yeah, it's a justification for regulation. It's just not a justification for depriving a moral actor of the right to vote if the moral act is subject to the law of the jurisdiction. Let's well, draw our section to a close. Thank you.